This is going to be about the topic of fundamental rights in the European Union's legal order. Before we start, though, I want to extend an invitation to you all from the module team to make contact with us um, sometime in the next week or two. We would like to hear how you're getting on. What have you done so far? What's working for you? What could be different? So please, could you do one of the following things? Either could you book into a team member's office hour? You can find details of how to do that on Blackboard in the teaching team part of Blackboard. Or come along to the module's virtual lounge drop-in, which Francesca is going to email you about or will perhaps already have emailed you about or contacted you about by the time you watch this video. Um, or post something in the module's discussion board on Google Currents. There's a hyperlink in the slide or you can reach Google Currents from Blackboard. Uh, this would be particularly useful if you're in a different time zone and so synchronous meeting is difficult for you. Or if none of these work for you, come along to Tammy's virtual water cooler on Google Meets at 10.30 on any weekday. Again, this is uh, there's a link for this in the slide. This is not just for this module. This is for anybody who wants to meet Tammy about anything. So we'd really like to, to know how you're getting on. Um, if you've got trouble with doing any of these things, please email me and um, I'll see what I can do to help. OK, turning now to the objectives of the lecture. So what we are going to do in this lecture is give you an introduction to fundamental rights in the European Union. So the lecture builds from the lectures earlier this week in the sense that it considers another legal constraint on union action. But there is more to fundamental rights protection in EU law than fundamental rights as a constraint on union action. So the lecture also builds out into other areas of the module, including into the electronic workbook and across into the second topic of the module on the internal market. And in this regard, you'll probably find that you need to revisit this lecture later on. The ways in which fundamental rights law works in the European legal space are complex. And one of the reasons for this is that within the geographically defined Europe, multiple legal orders protect fundamental rights. National constitutional law, the Council of Europe's European Convention on Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms, the European Union's legal order and international law, for example, emanating from the United Nations. This overlapping of legal orders creates complex questions of interlegality, put simply the interplay between different legal orders. As you will already be beginning to see, it doesn't make sense to think about these legal orders in relations of hierarchy. Another reason is that virtually all fundamental rights are not absolute. They can be departed from where there is a justification for doing so. The deprivation of liberty associated with responding to COVID-19 is a case in point. And sometimes one person's fundamental right is in conflict with another person's fundamental right. For instance, if I need a support animal because of my disability, for instance, a visual impairment, but my student needs an animal free learning environment because of her disability, for instance, an allergy. There's a nice summary of different types um, of competing rights in another context, the federal Canadian system, and I've put the hyperlink in the lecture notes to that. The aim of these lectures is to offer you a pathway through the complexity. Cat, you're not helping. As always, you will need to supplement your learning with a good textbook. I've used Craig and DeBerka and Barnard and Piers to inspire this lecture. And you will also see that there are links to other lectures, for example, about the rule of law question in Poland and Hungary, and to the electronic workbook, particularly the points about judicial review of union acts under Article 263 TFEU and Article 267 TFEU, and about supremacy or primacy and direct applicability and direct effect of union law. So this is the structure of the lecture. Um, 
First of all, we're going to look at fundamental rights as a limit on union power. And then we're going to look at fundamental rights as a limit on member state power. When we're looking at fundamental rights as a limit on union power, we need to think about fundamental rights as general principles of European Union law, which is a development that was led by the European Court of Justice. And we also need to think about fundamental rights in the European Union Charter of Fundamental Rights, which is a development led by the governments of the member states as masters of the treaties. When we're thinking about fundamental rights as a limit on member state power, we need to think about when member states implement union law, and we also need to think about when member states act within the scope of European Union law. Then we're going to look at fundamental rights as a justification for derogating from internal market law. I'll explain that in a bit. Um, but this is basically where the treaty freedoms, the free movement of the factors of production, clash with fundamental human rights. And then we're going to finish up by looking at the relationship between the European Union and the Council of Europe's European Convention on Human Rights and union oversight of fundamental human rights protection in its member states. Although that latter one is just going to be a very brief introduction because that will be covered in subsequent lectures. So let's turn first to fundamental rights as a limit on union power. The doctrines of supremacy or primacy and direct applicability of union law reach far into domestic legal systems. This was fine while union law was essentially a matter relating to technical trade issues and when union policies covered things like agriculture and fisheries. At that time too, the union institutions had to act through unanimity in council and so in effect the governments of the member states exercised control over the union's legislative agenda. The reach of the then EEC into administrative decision making, for example through agencies that act on behalf of the European Commission, was also much less widespread. Over time though, acts, legislative and administrative acts taken by the EU institutions, reached into more and more areas of nas national life. Now, as we've seen, the European Union has competence to act in various ways in a very wide range of areas. The European Union's powers in the criminal law field are a very important development here. State power to impose criminal penalties is an extremely important domain for fundamental rights control, because without control of such state power, very basic human rights, like the right to liberty, are not protected. The European Court of Justice began to be sensitive to these dynamics back in the 1960s. In the Stauder case, the Court of Justice, faced with an apparent conflict between a commission decision and the human right to dignity, adopted an approach of consistent interpretation. The proper meaning of the relevant decision, held the court, was one that protected the relevant human right. There was nothing in the treaty texts requiring or even enabling the court to do this. The court's reasoning asserts the fundamental human rights enshrined in the general principles of community law and protected by the court, you can read that in paragraph 7, as the basis for its decision. Where do these general principles of community law come from? And where does the court's obligation to protect them come from? Neither is explicitly enshrined in the treaty text at the time. These are judicially created principles of European Union law. The general principles have been developed over the years by case law and now include a very large list of principles, including administrative principles such as proportionality or due process rights like Nemo Udex in sui causa. But the Court of Justice has also held that the human rights in the European Convention on Human Rights are a special source of in inspiration. For instance, this is found in the Nold case, the Rutili case, P and S and Cornwall County Council, or Österreichisches Rundfunk. The Court of Justice has never held that the European Convention on Human Rights is formally binding on the EU, or that its provisions are formally incorporated into EU law. But the European, Court of, uh, the European Convention on Human Rights is an inspiration for general principles of European Union law. The court also sometimes refers to other international human rights instruments, such as the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, for its see, for example, the Kaltoft case. Another source of general principles is national constitutional legal orders. As Craig and de Burka point out, 
Although the court asserts regularly that this is a source of inspiration, in fact, the court relies relatively infrequently on this source. Opinions of advocates general sometimes survey national constitutional law. But the examples where the court cites a specific national constitutional provision are very rare. One example is a case from the 1970s called Transocean Marine Paint on the procedural right to be heard before an administrative decision affecting a company was taken. Most of this case law is now codified in Article 6.3 of the Treaty on European Union. I'll just get my treaty book. So Article 6.3 of the Treaty on European Union provides fundamental rights as guaranteed by the European Convention for the protection of human rights and fundamental freedoms and as they result from the constitutional traditions common to the member states shall constitute general principles of the Union's law. It's one thing to require a consistent interpretation to secure human rights protection when interpreting EU acts. This is the approach adopted in Stauder and still used today, for example, in the Google Spain case, in which the Court of Justice of the European Union interpreted the data processing directive so as to be consistent with Articles 7 and 8 of the European Union's Charter of Fundamental Rights, so as to secure the right to be forgotten by a search engine. It's quite another thing to hold that a union act is void because it breaches a human right. But this is the implication of the court's reasoning in the early cases, and it is now recognised as a ground of review of union acts. Judicial review, as you'll know from your work in the electronic workbook, judicial review of union acts is covered by the court's jurisdiction in Article 263 TFEU, which has quite restrictive rules on locus, i.e. on who can bring a claim, and in Article 267 TFEU, according to which a national court may refer to the Court of Justice of the European Union on a question of the validity of a Union Act, where the locus rules are determined at national level because the case begins and ends in a national court. In practice, the Court of Justice tends to uphold European Union legislation, even though it examines whether it is consistent with fundamental rights. Human rights, after all, are not absolute. Administrations may deviate from fundamental rights protections so long as they do so for a good reason and that their actions are proportionate. In many cases, especially in the early years of developing this jurisprudence, the court found that limitations on rights, for instance the right to property or freedom to trade, were justified by the union's overall objectives. After the lecture, I would like you to find two or three examples of cases where this has happened using a textbook. The Court of Justice has, however, found that European Union violates human rights. The Cadi litigation involving the right to a fair hearing is a case in point. Again, this is something that you can check out after the lecture using a textbook. And so is the Digital Rights Ireland case, where the Court of Justice found that the Data Retention Directive disproportionately infringed rights to data protection and privacy, as found in the European Union's Convention on uh, the European Union's own Fundamental Rights Charter. So that's a piece of active learning for you to do um, after the lecture, or you could pause the lecture now and do it now. If you've paused the lecture and done it now, well done. If you want to get some feedback on your work, on any of your work, please do check in with us and we will help you with that. In all of this, and especially in the rationale for its obligation to protect fundamental rights in the European Union's legal order, the Court of Justice, in essence, relies on an interpretation of just a few words setting out its obligations. These words are now found in Article 19 of the TEU, which says that the Court of Justice shall ensure that in the interpretation and application of the treaties, the law is observed. You will see immediately that this is a very slim basis for the Court to develop a significant line of jurisprudence and to take decisions that touch fundamental rights for human beings as well as for economic entities. If the Court gets its powers from the treaty text, as agreed by the sovereign member states, for the court to interpret those few words, the law, 
to mean that the union is subject to a wide range of legal provisions not set out anywhere in the treaties at the time goes to the question of legitimacy of the European Union's legal order. Why would the court do such a thing? The explanation for this lies in the court's development in parallel of the principle of supremacy or primacy of European Union law. You'll learn more about this as the module unfolds, but for now just note that several constitutional courts of the member states have challenged the notion that European Union law is at the pinnacle of a hierarchy, and many do not accept that interpretation of the supremacy doctrine, especially when it comes to human rights protection. As Eleanor Spreventa puts it in the Bonnard and Peers book, the more extensive the jurisdiction of the court, the more enthusiastic its pr protection of individuals, the more pronounced the intrusion into national law. And the inverse is also a concern. What if the standard of human rights protection guaranteed by European Union law is lower than that offered at domestic level? The key case here is from the 1970s, Internationale Handelsgesellschaft, and the decision of the German Federal Constitutional Court that is known as Solange I. You will have covered this when making your notes on supremacy of EU law, but just to remind yourself of it now, and if you're not familiar with it, then refresh yourself from the textbook that you're using. If you want to talk more about this, do get in touch. The interactions between the German Federal Constitutional Court and the Court of Justice of the European Union about the final arbiter of human rights protection continue to this day. The latest is the German Federal Constitutional Court's 2020 ruling in the Public Sector Purchase Programme case. I've put a hyperlink to that case in the slide, and it involves a response by the German Federal Constitutional Court to a decision of the European Court of Justice in a case called Vice, upholding the validity of a European Central Bank decision on a European public sector asset purchase programme. You will see when you have a look at it that this is a competence case about what counts as the boundaries of monetary policy, a question also considered in cases like the Pringle case and the Galweiler case. You will notice that there are links here between competence, supremacy and fundamental rights protection. The looser the court's competence control, the wider the reach of EU law, and the more that its supremacy threatens the protection of human rights in national legal orders. If this is not sounding familiar, then pause the lecture here and have a look at the, at the parts of the electronic workbook on supremacy again. One of the things that's really essential for you to understand this area of EU law is to understand the relationships and the differences between the European Union and the Council of Europe. So let's just take a step back for a minute and have a look at this blog that's hyperlinked in the, um, in the slide and then fill in the grid. You might need to use a search engine to find a few other bits of information. I've done the first few or I've done a few for you in the grid. As the blog says, the press often mixes up the Council of Europe and the European Union. The next time you spot a piece of journalism that does this, share it with the module cohort via Google Currents or tell us about it in a virtual office hour or a virtual module coffee or lunch. If you've done all of that, and if you're looking at this lecture again, perhaps uh, as a part of revision, as an extension activity, you might want to read this blog by Davor Petrish um, at Zagreb University and summarise his key arguments and see what he says about the PSPP case.